tell you what is that prevention for. Again, <laughs> Sao Jose, the Rio Beta, Sao Paulo, Brazil, we published over 100 papers in virology field with emphasis in arbovirus, and he is the current president of the Brazilian Society for Virology. And uh, Mauricio will present on the in interplay between different previruses, overview, and results from Brazil. Yeah, Mauricio. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. It was a really nice place to be. I'd like to thank Fundação Mejier for this opportunity to be with this very important crowd here. So we're gonna change a little bit subject. Now we're gonna talk about the interplay between this flavivirus in Brazil. So, okay, so let's try to, okay. We are doing fine in Brazil. We were used to dengue. We are uh, in middle of some dengue vaccine trials. I was uh, thinking already that I have to change subjects in my lab because what's going to happen, and then we start to see Zika in Brazil. The first time that I heard about Zika, even uh, being aware of what it was going on, I received a phone call from a friend. Uh, he works from Takeda, for Takeda. He was running a trial in the Northeast Brazil. He called me and said, Mauricio, can you help me? I have some problems here. We are seeing some dengue cases that are not dengue. I say, well, well what is this? <laughs> dengue that is not dengue? <laughs> Doesn't make sense to me. And we shot a little bit and he said, oh, I might send you send some, some samples. But uh, in fact, he was working with one pharmaceutical company. I was working with another <laughs> pharmaceutical company in a vaccine trial. Some people at somewhere found that there was some conflict of interest. And I completely forgot about that. This was somewhere in the end of 2014, okay? Uh, and then in 2015, we saw this, okay? This was the first publication from Zika, but was not the first identification. Um, the first one to detect was Professor Gubbio, Universidad Federal da Bahia. And I should point out that to Bosco that I disagree with you in one thing. I think that Zika was a tremendous failure of the Brazilian surveillance system. Zika circulated for two years before being spotted by one university hospital, that's Gubbio, and also Claudia, that was the Phil Cruz member here, was not part of the, uh, the network of surveillance at that time. But, okay, we got Zika in Brazil, so pretty much uh, when this paper was published, I just had contributed to, uh, to a book, a chapter of Book of Arbovirus. I said, oh man, I have to change my book now. <laughs> but I'm gonna probably add two slides in my classes because Zika really doesn't matter. That's what we think at the time, and then disappears. Well, Zika and microcephaly, and we have here Patricia's paper that probably is one of the most important papers that I ever had in my life for about this um, association of Zika and microcephaly. And the question is why? Why we are seeing this? This has never been reported before. We are expecting to see a mild disease, something that we're gonna don't even bother to test. We gonna, what is important for us is dengue. So why we are seeing this microcephaly? And then a lot of um, associations and explanations starts to jump in the journals at that time. As one of uh, reviewers once asked, uh, wrote in a manuscript that we published, a uh, reviewer wrote to the editors that sometime, maybe 10 years from now, some editors will be ashamed of a lot of publications that were published in these journals at that time. Well, there's a lot of wrong things, a lot of bad theories. And uh, one theory that tried to explain, and everybody jumped to explain why we haven't seen microcephaly in Brazil was because antibodies against flavivirus. 
this even does not make sense at all because the circulation in the Southeast Asia was also in regions that were endemic for flavivirus. But everybody liked this hypothesis and jumped in this hypothesis. But what is the, this famous antibody dependent enhancement? This is a model that uh, Stephen published several years ago, but I don't need to go further here, but basic, these heterotypic antibodies will facilitate the infections of macrophagic monocyte cells and induce a viral, a higher viral load and worsen symptoms. But this is an oversimplification of a much more complex system. This system, uh, we cannot exclude it, T cells in the system. We cannot exclude it, other factors in the system, but the bottom line of this system is that all these uh, being antibody dependent, dependent enhancement or T cell activation gonna lead to a cytokine storm. And this cytokine storm gonna produce severe manifestations in dengue. So this is a system that goes down to increase the cytokines and uh, increase of um, severe manifestations. Well, when, as I told you guys, we were uh, at that time of the Zika show up, working with a vaccine, the NIH Butantan vaccine. The day that we start to vaccinate in my site, exactly the day, the government of the state was there, the whole press in the same day this paper was published. And after we finished the presentation, we finished to vaccinate, uh, the two of the major newspapers in Brazil were talking to me and to, to Professor Kaliwa, then at the time director of the Butantan, asking us why you are putting people in danger. Because with what this paper said, our data indicates that immunity to dengue might deliver great Zika replication and have clear implications for disease pathogenesis and vaccine fut uh, future vaccine programs for Zika and dengue. This was written in a manuscript published in Nature Immunology at the day that we started the vaccination. So it took us several hours trying, talking to journalists, trying to explain that we're not putting people in danger. And this was based in vitro assays, antibody dependent enhancement in vitro. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, we also, a few months later, actually uh, one year later also, we have enhancement of Zika now in an in vivo model. Uh, start to knock out mouse that has pretty much the serum. Well, it's a very complex model, okay? And this model shows in one figure the presence of ADE in a, in a supplementary figure, uh, very buried in the paper that normal serum also kill mouse, normal human serum. It's in supplementary figure six, if I'm not wrong now. But anyway, what is ADE in vitro? It's a common experimental phenomenon. Use a, get a good virologist, a good antibody, a good cell line, and he play around, he gonna have enhancement at some point. It's really common in vitro for alpha virus, rabies, coxsackie, corona, HIV, with no clear implication whatsoever for clinical manifestations. Uh, ADE is pretty famous in flavivirus field, but we know that in vitro, dengue heterotypic antibodies produces ADE, that's fine. But even homotypic antibodies, if you work in a correct under certain circumstances also can cause in vitro ADE. And of course, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis antibodies, all playing around in vitro can also induce this antibody dependent enhancement. But in vivo, well, we, we took all the evidence that we have in the literature and we do believe that antibody dependent enhancement does exist in dengue, what, we, the, what you can see in the whole literature that it's common associated to a worse clinical outcome. 
that results in increased viral load, uh, clinical impairment, and a cytokine storm uh, that shows the high levels of cytokine, pro-inflammatory cytokine. So based on that, uh, last year, Nikos, myself, and Carlos, we wrote an opinion article when we proposed a clinical ADE definition. So ADE, we propose that be defined as a common in vitro phenomenon, but a hair in vivo occurrence, leading to a worsen of clinical presentation associated with hemodynamic change, increased viremia, and pro-inflammatory cytokines. So when we talk to about ADE in vivo, we want to see these manifestations that have been reported in, uh, so far in the literature. So we decide to check, is this is true? Are we seeing this? Well, I live in an endemic city with endemic dengue circulation, and we have a Zika outbreak. So the best way to see this is not in vitro, is in a population. Because if, if I cannot see a phenomenon in a population, it really doesn't matter for epidemiological purposes. That's what we want. So I have four cohorts going on in my city. An hospital-based cohort. We do active surveillance with the public health authority. We have a general population cohort that's prospectively followed and we set up a preg pregnant woman cohort. I'm gonna show some data about this. Yeah. Oops, I'm sorry. So for who doesn't know, this is my city. It's in the northeast of Sao Paulo state, uh, in the region of Brazil with the highest standard of living. Uh, it's one of the most richest cities in the country. Uh, we are about 500,000 people uh, with a human development index uh, about the same of the England. 100% of the population has access to uh, water in their house, so there is no containers outside. 100% uh, of the population has treated sewer system, was one of the few cities in Brazil that has this, but it's still we have one of the highest dengue incidents of the country. Of course, we live in a perfect place for mosquitoes. The average temperature of the city is 25 degrees over the year and range 2,000 millimeters. So it's perfect for mosquitoes, not for us. In this city, we have this neighborhood, Villa Toninho here. It's a 10,000 people neighborhood that is closed for all sides. And there's a highway here and jungle here, here, here. So we use this neighborhood as a small city model to work. And we have here a prospective cohort uh, population that have been followed over the years. So in late 15, we recruited uh, about uh, 5,500 people uh, over 10 years old. We decided not to use children because they were too problematic in terms of uh, um, ethical committees. So we came back one year later. Actually, we did active surveillance also, but one year later, we collected 900 people who have to exclude someone who decide to enroll in a dengue vaccine <laughs> to trial. And the bottom line, we have 800 samples that were paired between two years. What happened between these two years in, in, in our city? A dengue outbreak that was bigger than the Zika outbreak that happened at the same time. So in the first year, we have 74% uh, of the people were already positive for dengue. And the second year, this raises for 85%. But Zika was 10%. And at that time, there was no Zika case reported in the city. So we fail also <laughs> in the surveillance there. <laughs> but the outbreak that was happened here raises the number of uh, positive Zika patients for 10 to 29%. This was done by a series of ELISAs, TRMTs, whatever. We are pretty confident in these numbers. We, at that time, we found six, six five dengue suspected patients with acute symptom. We could de uh, detect seven acute cases of dengue. Uh, and uh, more dengue confirmed by seroconversion and eight cases of Zika confirmed by seroconversion. And we have a symptomatic to asymptomatic rate 
of the Zika is 20 to 1, instead of the usual 5 or 6 to 1 that has been published. Uh, I'd like to remember you were talking about a population that is 80, f uh, was, I'm sorry, at the baseline, 75% positive for dengue. And the yellow fever vaccine coverage in this population is over 95%. So taken together, the conclusion for the cohort, we had a high level of dengue circulation at that time. The baseline was 75% dengue positive. Uh, this is not here, but Zika zero prevalence was detected before the circulation and almost 20% of the population seroconverted for Zika in one year but the symptomatic for symptomatic ratio was almost one to 20. And this can be related to pre-existing high levels of dengue antibodies, okay, instead of enhancement and more disease, what we are seeing is more protection, a symptomatic disease, or high levels of anti yellow fever antibodies, or maybe some mistakes in the surveillance pro protocol. But for the people who works with a vaccine and Zika vaccine, the good news is I still have 70% of the population susceptible, so we still can do trials there <laughs> if you want. So we decided to do another patient study to check for the ADE using the all that we said, clinical symptoms, cytokine, and viremia. So we study patients, acute patients, and First, we found that there was no difference in IgG seroprevalence in this cohort. So the people who went to hospital that were both dengue or Zika, the number of secondary infections are the same for both dengue and Zika. There is only one severe disease in the dengue group, and no difference in Zika severity in the dengue IgG or dengue IG, uh, IgG positive or dengue IgG ne negative. So what I'm telling you here is that the first criteria, clinical worsening, is not happening in this population. So we went to the second criteria, that was the viral load. So the viral load, the Zika viral load in people exposed or not exposed to dengue before was the same. When you see dengue, you have some outgroups here that might be the ADE patients or not. But uh, the average here is pretty much the same. And we third look for cytokines. You cannot read this here, probably, but you have to trust me or go to the journal. This was published in the Clinical Infectious Disease last year, showing that there is no difference in cytokine levels between Zika patients that were primate or not primate with, with dengue. But if you look in the dengue group, there is difference of cytokine levels in patients who were pre-exposed or not pre-exposed to other dengue uh, serotypes. So looking for clinical viral load or cytokine, there is no difference in this population. Uh, this was published so last year, uh, and actually we designed this paper in a restaurant just after we finished the interviews with the newspaper, Dr. Kalil and myself. <laughs> we vaccinated people, we got destroyed by the news, and then sit down and decide how we're gonna reply this in a scientific way. So based on this data and some other data published by uh, in animal models by Carlos, we proposed that we can find Zika AD in vitro, but uh, in some animal models, but not in primates. So we don't have evidence that this does happen so far. So new woman, uh, if it's not making AD, it's protecting. So we decided to look at our pregnant woman cohort. Uh, actually, not our general population cohort. Oh man, that's the wrong, no, it's the correct one. So I made another question. So the level of antibodies in patients with acute Zika infection are the same of the general population. The patient who goes to the ER has the same profile of the general population. That's one important question. So we looked at, and uh, we use very stringent 
methods of uh, uh, discriminate patients with disease. We use a PRNT-90 with a uh, threshold for positive 1 to 40. So we're pretty sure that these antibodies are quite specific. So when we look for people with acute disease in the general population, we show that dengue 1 and dengue 4 antibodies does protect against acute infection. And we should note that dengue 1 and dengue 4 were the virus that circulated two years before the Zika outbreak. Okay, so this, uh, this non-specific antibodies raised by dengue infection are in fact protecting against Zika. So we also look for uh, our pregnant woman. This is also published, so I'm gonna go really fast on that, but uh, we followed 57 laboratory confirmed Zika pregnant women. We started from 1,000 pregnant women, suspected cases, and our case definition is laboratory confirmed Zika pregnant woman. So we follow them looking for adverse outcomes and detection of viral RNA in the child being urine or blood of the children. And our frequency of adverse outcome, the incidence was pretty much what Patricia found in Rio de Janeiro, about 28%, but much less severe. I did not have any microcephaly in my guilty group. We have some radiological findings, some abnormal uh, autoacoustic exams, some retinal disease, but no severe manifestation. That's different from what Patricia found in Rio de Janeiro and is completely different what they report in Northeast Brazil. So why? And that's the why came again. Looking for this why, I found this paper. This is not mine. So these guys, they just overlap two maps. The map of incidence of yellow fever, oh, I'm sorry, incidence of microcephaly in Brazil, and the map of vac yellow fever vaccine coverage. And what happened that when you overlap the two maps, the microcephaly happens much more frequent where there is not yellow fever vaccine. Well, it's interesting. Uh, don't ask me about the hard doc, data about this paper. I'm, uh, I'm not an author of this paper. I just said that. And that, in fact, does make sense. Uh, you don't need to have maps. When you look for talk, if you know a little bit about the yellow fever vaccine coverage in Brazil, this does make sense. So we decided to check that. We talked to Patricia because my region is pretty much everybody yellow fever vaccinated. I talked to Patricia, so she sent her samples. And the first thing that we tried to figure out is that there is a relationship between yellow fever antibody levels and viral load, Zika viral load at diagnosis. No, we couldn't find that. They were all the way around. But when you compare antibody levels and the outcome, the antibody levels with no outcome, moms that have been infected and delivered on normal children, they have higher antibody levels than compared with mothers who have uh, either microcephaly or an abortion after infection with Zika. And in fact, when you do the geometric mean of the antibody levels, it will have a very significant effect. I'm telling you that this is protection. No, I'm telling you that there is a correlation between the two data. So concluding now, we have no evidence of enhancement in clinical infection of Zika, no evidence, evidence of clinical antibody-dependent enhancement in pregnant women. There is some level of protection for an acute Zika infection induced by dengue 1 and dengue 4 antibodies. That was the two virus that circulated in the years before. And no significance for dengue 3 and dengue 2 in our study, but dengue 3 has not circulated over 10 years, so we're probably expecting these antibodies are really low levels, high affinity antibodies that probably will not induce any reaction. And the yellow fever antibody levels are correlated 
I'm trying to be really cautious <laughs> here with a better prognosis in Zika-infected women. And I'd like to thank my collaborators, University of Texas, Universidade de Minas Gerais, Fiocruz, University of Sao Paulo, our public health people, UNESP and the Fundação de Medicina Tropical in Manaus, and my students in my lab, a big team. Thanks a lot.